With the Wells Fargo Active Cash Credit Card, you can earn unlimited 2% cash rewards on purchases you want and purchases you need. That means you earn on what you want, like trying out that new workout class, and 2% cash rewards on what you need, like a foam roller for your sore muscles. That's the beauty of the Active Cash Credit Card. It's ready when you are, with unlimited 2% cash rewards. The Wells Fargo Active Cash Credit Card. That's real life ready. Terms apply. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash active cash. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. However you're watching, wherever you're watching, however you listen, wherever you listen, it's the Bet Online Salute Detroit podcast, and it's only two-thirds of the tripod today, but that's all right. Ryan's always with us in spirit, but we got the madman. The beard's growing in, folks. The beard's growing in. We need to check. All right, Jamal, real quick. So I I'm, I got the trial version of NCAA 25. I, I, you know. So I picked USC for my road to glory. The first year, year one, um, and I did like underdog. Then they say like never do underdog. Like it's true. You, you will never play. Year one, <clears throat> this is just, I know it's computer anime. It's not real, but SC opened up one and two. They lost an overtime to LSU, like 44, 45 or something like that. They, they spanked Utah State. They got whooped by... Uh, they got whooped by Michigan. They won the Big Ten championship, believe it or not. They Ooh, okay, okay. This is year one. They beat Ohio State in the Big Ten championship. They lost in the first round of the playoffs to Texas A&M. Wow. And so wow. I, I call I call BS on the loss to Texas A&M. I feel like SC could compete with Texas A&M, like for sure, for sure, no question about it. It's interesting. I mean, uh, the coach, I hope you're not foreshadowing here. You know, you're just I, sort of saying I, things. So, so that will lead to before I ask you that. And then the next year, next year went undefeated and lost in the semifinal to Ohio State. So, would wow. you take those two concurrent years? Would you take those years? Would I take the? That's a, that's a good question. Would I take those two years? Yeah, I would. I would too. That's those are yeah, pretty good. Yeah, I would are... because I mean, at the end of the day, you're talking about two playoff appearances, and by next year, you're a Final Four team. I mean, I think yeah. I would take it. With Miller Moss at the helm, and Miller Moss was the Heisman Trophy his rusher senior year. Also, there you go. Did, did Moss win the Heisman that that second year for you? The oh, second year, yeah, yeah, yeah he did. Year. Okay, he wonderful, wonderful. Out. I was like, uh, Lincoln. Look at Coach. Off. Okay. All <laughs> it's right. all computer generated. I'm not saying that's going to happen. But with that being said, how are you doing? I, I just had to let you know that. But how are you doing? No, I love it, Coach. Always great to see you. Of course, we miss Ryan. But, you know, you and I, I think, will suffice today with a very fun conversation, as we always do. So I didn't pull it up in time, but we'll just generally talk about it. The goose. The goose says hello, everybody. <laughs> um. Lane Kiffin had a conversation today with our anarchist, I guess you could say. Anarchist. Oh, our, I like the terminology. Okay. Our anarchist, Paul Feinbaum, right? The supervillain Paul Feinbaum. And Lane Kiffin legit just sat down and asked him. He read down all his stats of what he said, like, should have called for me. Thank you for getting me fired. Thank you for putting me in this opportunity. And pretty much ended it saying, what have you ever accomplished? What have you ever done? I might be paraphrasing, but we know what we're talking about here. And Paul Feinbaum sat with a poopy face and didn't have any response. <laughs> and, well, you know, we were talking through the day, and that encouraged us to come up. Paul Feinbaum had been controversial this whole week talking about Pac-12. No, I'm sorry, not Pac-12, Big Ten. I got to get used to saying Big Ten. Talking about a Big Ten team the whole week. At SEC Media Day, Lane Kiffin kind of defended USC. I guess you would say he has roots, you know, and <clears throat> and uh, roots at USC. We'll say that. So, 
today. Well, I've you been- know, coach, what's what's interesting? Just real quick before we we segue, that was just uh, an evisceration of of Paul Feinbaum by Lane Kiffin. You could tell the lane train, you know, sort of remembered, you know, the yeah. way, you know, kind of MJ remembers the way Kobe remembers, you know, lane remembered. And I think he really attributed his firing the night that he got tarmac to Paul Feinbaum because Paul Feinbaum that night, a couple hours before went on ESPN and talked about how lane Kiffin. And I didn't even really understand this analogy at the time. I had to like, look it up where he called lane Kiffin the Miley Cyrus of college football. And right, basically right. said that, uh, you know, he's, he should be fired. And, and Kiffin remembered that, uh, very strongly and, and, you know, really sort of doubled down on that. Talked to Feinbaum about how, if you recall, Feinbaum basically predicted the demise of Nick Saban. That never happened. And so really sort of went into it. And, you know, Coach, what's interesting, you know, we've been talking about this now for a week in terms of Paul Feinbaum. I think the the Lincoln-Riley hatred, criticism, all of those things, the USC slant uh, in terms of negativity, I think it all has started with Lane Kiffin. I think Lane Kiffin was that original target for Paul Feinbaum. And I actually had to look this up. I heard this from a third party and I needed to verify it. And it started to make sense. Where did Paul Feinbaum graduate from school, coach? Do you know? That's how he went to UCLA. No, no. He went to Tennessee. Oh, and if you oh recall, the late night the lane train <laughs> in the middle of the night, leaving Tennessee to go to USC. He pulled the I Mayflower. think it all started from that. And I think this sort of despise of USC, this despise of USC coaches for Paul Feinbaum, I think began that night and has carried over 15 years since. So that was sort of a full circle moment for me, coach. But Paul Feinbaum, the Tennessee volunteer, I think he is uh, he's sticking to those guns there and, and holds a lot of resentment for Lane and now kind of the, the Lane successors. Very interesting there in terms of what happened. And just as a side note, uh, Coach, it's, it's fascinating that you call him kind of the supervillain. You know, because Paul Feinbaum, if you, if you dressed him up in all white or all black, like he could be a Bond villain. He kind of looks <laughs> the part, you know? So yeah. I think supervillain is a great term right there. It's it, and it's interesting and like I don't know why he's upset with Lane. I don't know why Oklahoma fans are, which is weird. I didn't know Oklahoma was that way because Malik Riley says you can't pass up USC, and he was at Oklahoma, and it kind of makes me think. Right, it's like there's certain jobs you can't pass up. When Lane was at Tennessee, if anything better came, you take it. At that time, when Lane was at Tennessee, right? Like, there's no doubt. <clears throat> it's unfortunate. And I remember when they hired Lane at USC, I was like, you know, Coach Kiff wasn't like one of my favorite coaches, but like he was still one of my coaches. Like it's unfortunate that they hired him to take on water during probation. And then he comes off probation. He's trying his best to compete with a diminished roster and he's getting beat on the road in Phoenix. And then he gets left on the tarmac. Like they wanted instant gratification. It wasn't a good idea. It wasn't fair or whatever, but the thing about Lincoln Riley, and I and I, I thought about this too. Like he said, you can't pass up USC. Like you were at Oklahoma, though. Like, how is SC a better job than Oklahoma? Nobody ever really stepped back and really thought about that comment. Like when SC called, I couldn't pass that up. Like, but dude, you're at Oklahoma. You're at one of the big logos. What's going on over there? That's a topic for a different day, but that's something to kind of think about. And I think it triggered Feinbaum because. Just as as Lincoln left another school for USC, the way Lane left his school for USC, I think that re-triggered a lot of things. Because we didn't hear a lot about from Feinbaum with regards to Sark. And, you know, truth be told, there was a lot of material there at the end. And then we didn't hear much from Feinbaum with Helton. And obviously, Helton was more irrelevant from a national perspective, so you can understand that. But it is interesting that the two guys where the perception is they kind of jilted schools in the middle of the night to go to USC. Those are the two targets of of Feinbaum's criticism. Uh, We're starting to trace it back, Coach. I mean, if you want to lie down on the couch and we just turn this into a nice therapy session, uh, you know, we're game. I mean, Salute Detroit might turn into, you know, Sofa Detroit, uh, you know, at this rate. my, My one question is before we jump into our segment. 
let's just say SC goes to the final four. What does Paul say? Well, coach, I, you know, I, the, our, the article that, uh, you know, I alluded to a couple of days ago is, is up on LAFB.com now, LAFBnetwork.com about Lincoln Riley. The 2023 version of Lincoln Riley is the 2011 version of LeBron James, you know, college football's LeBron. And I think that, I think some of the tension gets alleviated if he makes it to the final four, but it'll depend on how the team performs. I think truly in the eyes of, of the Paul Feinbaums of the world, I think Lincoln's got to bring home title number 12 to the Cardinal and gold for it to kind of completely rest. Which we are getting our title back, apparently. That's like in the works for us to get our title back from the Reggie Bush incident. Just as switch. It's, yeah, but I mean, that, 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 sure. But that, uh, you're talking about like the BCS. I mean, you know, but we, we're already regarded as AP national champions in 03 and sure. 04. So it's not going to affect the, the number of, <coughs> nas- it's not going to affect the national title count. Right, we still count it. We don't, we yeah, don't take yeah. anything. But um, yeah, Paul Feinbaum was he got a taste of his own medicine. I think he just went back to his hotel room. And was like he had a look in the mirror, like I better change what I say. I didn't expect that. I bet Lang was like, "Yeah, I'll take the last day with Paul on his <laughs> network. I, I, I will have the very last interview." He was looking good too. He had the the, plaid, the lane uh, train, baby. Yeah. The lane train. He had you the know, plaid you sports coat on. He has hair done. I was like, all right. Lane, I mean, like- in many ways, Lane is like the quintessential USC coach. Like he he was supposed to be the successor to Pete in so many ways. You know, in terms of just you know the the look, the aura, the ability to recruit. Uh, you know, the personality. So perhaps in a different life, perhaps down the line. But wishing Lane nothing but the best here, coach. Yeah. I think he's got a real chance. Um, you know, folks may think this is a, a hot take. I think Lane has a real chance to win a national title here in the next two or three years. Also, what if I told you Lane was very introverted when I was there? I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Big time introvert. Like, yeah, he, yeah. He only talks to the receivers. It's only, people yeah, yeah. Ash rode the, receiver. Ash rode the cart, man, to take the coaches in at halftime, you know, oh, he so he, he got, he got to sit next to Lane quite a bit. There you go. Good deal. Let's jump into our segment. That was a good little tangent there. Uh, so, leaning on Paul Feinbaum, Paul Feinbaum, we wanted to bring up the five most controversial figures in USC history. So, we put the little list together. Jamal has five. I have five. We'll go back and forth. <clears throat> we have not seen each other's list. Some may match. Some may not match. Maybe different, difference of opinions. But I think I know... We know two for sure <clears throat> who may match. You're USC's historian, so I think we have three on our list that might match. But I don't know where they are on my list. I don't. I mean, I know where they are on my list. I don't know where they are on your list. But I think I have two that might be a little bit slate different. So I'll let you kick it off. You start with your number five. We'll talk about. It. I'll go with my number five. Go ahead. What do you got for yeah, your number coach? Five? And so you know, obviously, in honor of of the fine bomb, you know, kind of controversy for USC, we said, oh, wouldn't it be fun to talk about the five most controversial figures slash players in, in USC football history? Coach, my number five is going to be Mike Will, Mike Williams, and you know, oh, the that's first a good true one. great, you know, receiver of the twenty first century. When you talk about how great Mike Will was two years at USC, 02 and 03, 30 receiving touchdowns over those two years. Carson's favorite target, really the linchpin in many ways to Carson's Heisman run in 02. And then obviously backing that up with a sophomore performance, the national championship in 03. That famous, you know, the the Philly special. We talk about it all the time that it was really USC invented the Philly special. Yep. It was Mike Will with that lefty throw back to Leinart. In that Rose Bowl against Michigan, what a decorated career Mike Will had. But the reason I have him as number five in terms of controversial figure coaches, him and Maurice Claret decided to make that jump, right, one year prior to eligibility, right? With, With the NFL, you have to be three years removed from your high school class. Both Mike Will as well as Maurice Claret were early. They wanted to challenge that rule, challenge the NCAA, and challenge kind of the NFL system. And ultimately, it didn't work out for either guy. That that missing that one year was really significant. But what a story that was, Coach, in terms of kind of taking on an established rule for so many years. And I wonder, I, I go back and I wonder, had Mike Will come back to USC for a third year and then declared, what does that career look like? You know, when you talk about how big he was 
how physical the hands. I mean, it was almost sort of Julio Jones before Julio Jones in so many ways. He was such a physical freak. Uh, I wonder sometimes a big what if. Could Mike Will, in in my eyes, an all pro, someone who would be regarded as one of the three to five best receivers in the NFL over over a half decade to a full decade, what might have been? But Mike Will, my number five. And of course, Mike Will now back with the program. We're thrilled to see that. He was obviously there my freshman and sophomore year at USC, so soft place in my heart. But Mike Will is my number five for taking on the NCAA, Coach. I, I think they should change that. They, they, I should, no, I'm sorry. Let me, let me, I'm sorry. Cause every time I say something, people only hear the first part that I say, cause I got trash for saying <laughs> there was like Texas made the playoff last year. And I definitely said, oh no, that was Oklahoma who won five games. They forgot that. They didn't listen to that part. So I take that back. I don't think they should change the rule because they should not, because those are grown men in the NFL. And that's different type of strength. That is grown man strength in the NFL. So the three year move is good. I think they should change the rule like they do with the NBA. You have up until the draft to decide if you're going to go. And if you don't get drafted, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's where I get a little fuzzy with it. If you don't get drafted, I think you have the opportunity to go back, or it's like up into the draft. If you don't feel like you're going to get drafted, you could go back. Something like that. But yeah, there's there's the football a, needs to have that same rule. Yeah, coach, it's it's you know you have kind of a, a certain deadline to keep your name in the hat, but of course. It's hiring the agent uh, essentially eliminates your amateur status. So you can kind of keep your name in the hat. But if you don't hire an agent, you have the opportunity to revert back. So um, for sure, I think there's an opportunity there to kind of maybe bridge that gap a little bit in the NFL, to your point. Well, definitely, because now everybody has an agent. Right. right. It's early now. So you might as well have the rule. Great point. Yep. You know what I mean? So come on now, NCAA. My number five. I'm going to go with this also a receiver, but these are the latter years of the 90s. I'm going to go with Keyshawn Johnson. Nice. Right? And people are like, well, why do you say Keyshawn Johnson? Keyshawn Johnson was not a friendly person. <laughs> he was not great in the media. If you ever try to get his autograph, like, he has the reputation of being – just being a dick. Like, people do not really like Keyshawn Johnson. They don't like him in the NFL. He's, he's better now that he's on TV, and I get it. He's going to get a check. But, like, personally, like, personal-wise, like, if you know Keyshawn Johnson, what he did in the NFL and all the trouble he caused, he was not a very good staple. And like Pete Carroll used to say, a model citizen to society. So that, that on my list, number five, I think Keyshawn Johnson is one, uh, one of the controversial figures. Love, love that one, Coach. I think that's a great one. I was contemplating Keyshawn. Uh, you know, he was close, you know, and, and it, sometimes you sort of have to define controversy and what what elements of controversy that you sort of want to lean into. So uh, but I'm totally with you. Of course, everyone uh, recalls his famous book. Just give me the damn ball. Remember, yeah. when he made it to the NFL, which was so Keyshawn, right? It was always <laughs> about Keyshawn. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, a, a tough teammate at times, a tough, uh, you know, sort of tough with the media, tough with the fans, um, you know, but at the end of the day, hey, he won a Rose Bowl with USC and then uh, had had the opportunity to win a Super Bowl with Tampa Bay. You know, I don't think he was quite the great wide receiver in the NFL that we all thought that would sort of justify the number one pick, but certainly a terrific career in the NFL and love the pick there, coach. He's not a Hall of Famer, but he's definitely like a name to remember. Yep. You know absolutely. what I mean? Like he's one, he's a, like, I don't, would you say he was a superstar? I don't think so. I think he was a, he was a star, you know, on on some yeah. on some great, you know, the, those Tampa teams were great. Um, the Giants, so, he was good with the yeah, Giants. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Jets, yeah. The Jets, the Jets. I'm sorry, yeah, the yeah, Jets, yeah, yeah. The Jets, definitely. All right, go ahead. What's your number four, Coach? So I'm gonna kind of go back a little bit, kind of historically here. Number four for me is Sam Bam Cunningham, and the reason for that. Is, oh, you're going positive. You're going positive. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, Sam okay. Bam Cunningham, and the reason for that really historic moment, Coach. You've made references to this in shows past over the over the last several months and years frankly but that moment that seminal moment when USC went into Tuscaloosa Alabama uh, for the first time uh, with you know Paul Bear Bryant of Alabama did not believe in in the integration of, of having black players on his roster Sam Bam Cunningham at that time USC star running back really ran all over Alabama USC won that game 42-21 and in many ways, that was an inflection point of opening up uh, integration from a college football perspective in the South. So 
certainly a, a controversial moment, but to your point, Coach, not in a negative way, in a very positive way uh, of being able to really change the sport as well as society for the better. And I think it was probably a, a very controversial time and moment in the South, in Tuscaloosa, for SC to come in there. So for those reasons, Sam Bam Cunningham is my number four on this list. I met Sam Bam. He was so happy I was wearing 39 when, I, when oh, he first Oh, that's me. amazing. Sam Bam, every t- every game, I said, 39, 39, man. I ain't seen nobody in 39 in a long time. Um, Just to just to clarify your story, because I don't want him to, to kill us in the comments. Alabama didn't want to integrate. Bear Bryant did want to integrate. Okay, that's yeah, why he yeah, set yeah, the yeah, game yeah. up. Gotcha, gotcha. He, no, that, he that, that's came correct. Out, yep. Yeah, he came out and met Paul McKay and was like, hey, we need you to come down here and play us. And he didn't want to do it. And then Paul McKay was like, all right, you guys got to come to us. And we'll go to you guys. And then he brought him yeah, in the yeah, locker room. Yeah, and, and, and John uh, McKay. Paul John Bear McKay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, that was that was my bad coach. It was administration. The yeah. university didn't want to. You know, uh, Paul Bear Bryant did. Yeah. Well, like the next year they had like twelve players. On their team yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh well, maybe you were right about something. So definitely, my number four. Um, I need to go see a shrink because I got all negatives. Now you made me. Now you're making me feel bad, but it is what it is. My number four is Pat Hayden. I think the reason why USC is in the way they are now is because of the decisions of Pat Hayden. Um, And this is, I guess this is more of an internal thing or a USC thing or like our classic thing, but like Pat Hayden um, let a lot of things go that mattered to the university, let people wear, get rid of the white shoestrings and all the traditional stuff that doesn't matter to the outside eye, but matters to purists of USC uh, he tried to stay in the Pete Carroll tree. He never really, he never really tried to buck the change. Right, the change was needed, but he wanted to stay. He wanted to keep that Pete Carroll thing alive, and it really didn't work. I did like the Sark hire. I'm a bigger Sark fan than Kiffin fan. Um, I think Sark is a little bit better coach, but it's like, you know, odds and ends and reasons why. But they're both good coaches. I'm not going to take anything. But I would pick Sark over Kiffin. But they just never let that go. I think Sark would have turned the corner. But issues happen. But Pat Hayden never really was like, you know what? It's time for a change program wise. And he never made that program. And I think the program stayed at a low for such a long time. And now they're trying to make us an instant climb. And it's taken a long time to climb the mountain because of Pat Hayden. Yeah, no, coach. I think it's a really fair point. Obviously, what an interesting figure Pat Hayden is in terms of his life, right? Um, mm-hmm. He was quarterback of SC early to mid seventies quarterback, the national championship team was the kind of the lefty quarterback legend Then had a wildly successful career in law and real estate was a road scholar, in fact. And then with, um, Mike Garrett's, uh, you know, departure as, as USC athletic director, you know, the university decided to go with Pat Hayden to kind of almost create sort of a certain image um, and, and I think it was controversial from the get-go, Coach, in a very negative way. He, he was never a Kiffin guy. Kiffin was a Garrett hire. He was looking to get rid of Kiffin the moment uh, he could. Uh, in, you know, he kind of inherited the program in, in the crux of the sanctions, hired Sark. Uh, that didn't work out. And then, of course, I think he's, he's very much regarded for the handling of Coach O. I mean, if you, re- you recall after Sark, Coach O now goes 6-2. and two. Right. Uh, as interim Wins the coach, Rose Bowl. you know, it goes six and two. Unfortunately, those two losses were to the two rivals in Notre Dame and UCLA. But he, he resurrected that that run. The players loved him so much. And he decided to go in a different direction. And he essentially said, oh, because he's not a country club guy. Right. If yeah. you recall. So Pat Hayden just felt very much out of touch with what the players wanted, uh, with, with who the folks were on the field. He's felt very ivory tower. And then, of course, he was the athletic director during the Larry Scott era in the Pac-12. Had an opportunity to kind of say and advocate from a Pac-12 network perspective, which was such a dubious deal to begin with. So both from an on-the-field as well as from an off-the-field standpoint, Pat Hayden's certainly a very controversial figure. And like you and I talked about, Coach, I mean, SC has not been USC since 2008. And Pat Hayden is a, a, a significant reason as to why. Yep, definitely. So no disagreement there. And I mean, you're SC. You could go in there like Texas used to do with the Big Twelve. This is what we're doing. This is how we're going to do it. Larry, shut up. You're just the face. This is our conference. Like at right. the end of the day, that's. I mean, sometimes you have to lay the hammer down, and he should have laid it down. 
we'll go on to number three. What is your number? Who's your number three? So, Coach, now it, it, it kind of gets interesting here. But for me, number three is El Presidente Reggie Bush. You know, it's hard to sort of have this list without the great Reggie Bush on it. Obviously, for my money, the most electric player in the history of college football, certainly the most electric player that I've ever seen live um, and in my lifetime. What an incredible career. Everything that we think about of USC in terms of greatness really over the last 40 plus years is attributed to that 03 to 05 period with Leinert and Bush. But of course, the controversy with the Heisman and the first and only individual to have his Heisman trophy vacated, which in today's terms with NIL for a non-issue, but back then a lot of gray area, a lot of fuzz there in terms of, you know, what was kind of taken in in terms of sort of helping his family. Um, So for all of those reasons, Coach, very, very controversial figure in USC history. I think it it sort of accelerated the the exit of Pete in many ways and sort of the distancing of Pete from the program for a number of years. And then, of course, it's just a very interesting relationship that Reggie now has with USC. Even though he's been reinstated, I think we expect the Utah State game that home opener to be kind of the the unveiling of two Heisman Trophy jerseys, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to see the 13, and we want to see the five back in the Paris style. But I think uh, a lot of damage has been done in terms of the relationship between Reggie and USC. There's a distance there. There's sort of a formality there. And hopefully over time it comes back. But for all of those reasons, much of which wasn't Reggie's fault and some people say it was Reggie's fault and you know it's still kind of controversial to this day in so many ways uh but I think the the USC faithful believe uh and rightfully so that the Heisman belongs to Reggie Bush in 2005 it's great that it's back it's great SC's got eight of them uh we never thought it was any other number besides that number and it's great to have number five formally retired yet again nobody wore it since 05 we all knew what was up but for all of those reasons for how big a story it was, how how unprecedented it was, Coach. I got Reggie at number three. Yeah, so, you know, I listened to Brady Quinn and LeVar Aronson in the morning driving into work. So Brady Quinn legit told a story this morning. It's crazy how things flow. His car was getting towed. He had to pay $150. The professor paid $150 for him. He goes to the football facility. Uh, Charlie Wise tells him you're ineligible because the professor called compliance and said I paid for him. Brady Quinn was ineligible. He had to figure out how to pay $150 by the time practice started. Actually, two times he had to pay $300. There was a fine to it. There's a penalty to it. He had to pay $300 by the time practice started and, and donated to a charity in order for him to become eligible, which I think is insane. With that being said, my number three is actually the same thing as Reggie Bush. Um, from how I heard it happen, I think investigation was shoddy Hmm. and i think that it was there were rules broken but i think the rules weren't as what they made it seem on tv it was legit a family friend no agents were ever involved it was a friendly friend mom was getting evicted out the house mom said that was getting evicted out the apartment he was like hey i show houses i've had this house hasn't been so you guys can rent it they were legit paying rent it was not a free house that's the part that everybody skips over. That's the part that everybody doesn't ever look at. His parents were paying rent in that house. So how are we? How did those violations happen if his parents were paying rent in that house? That's you know that's the question that gets a little weird for me. But that's the story I heard. But just know, Petro Papadakis broke more rules <laughs> than anybody because if you're on a recruiting visit at the time of Pete Carroll you go visit his dad's restaurant there's a couple rules being broken I'll just leave it at that but neither here nor there it caused a big controversy put the school on probation the five's not in there uh they're trying I I feel like they're trying to repair the relationship with Reggie Bush and I feel like they're doing a better job his Heisman presentation was in the uh What's the name of that club up there in the stadium? Is it the Yeah, the Coliseum Club? Club. Yep. Yeah, the Coliseum Club. They did the presentation there. Um, he hopefully he is at more games and they get him to come around a lot more. Same thing with Pete. You know, and I've always been a big facilitator that like we need to get Pete back and somehow, some way, it's good to have people like that around your program. So Reggie, yeah, it was big news for a very long time. We're still talking about it to this day. 
I mean, if it was today's world, it's just like, oh, well, he got a house with his NIL deal. It's not a big deal, but it was a big deal back then. The second sure. worst, the second worst penalty handed down by the NCAA compared to SMU. So yep. it was a yep. big deal. Definitely. What is your number three? Well, coach, no, uh, two, two, two. We're on number two. two. So I, uh, you know, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, but for me, number two, Robo QB, Todd Marinovich, you know, that's uh, the late eighties, you know, just what an incredible figure he was in the late eighties to mid nineties, just the whole story of, you know, his father, you know, ultimately training him as sort of almost this machine, this perfect quarterback you know, with the rigor and the discipline uh, that comes with almost like the military services. You know, he had a he had a police background and and, and a military background. So it was sort of with that mindset that uh, Marinovich became a high school legend here in Southern California, goes to USC and then kind of gets the taste of freedom for the first time. And then all hell breaks loose uh, just in terms of all different kinds of vices. And then, of course, his famous back and forth coach in the late 80s with Larry Smith, the coach, and how Larry Smith, uh, uh, again, another control freak. He was very, very similar where like his father was very controlling and then Larry Smith was very controlling. And all the famous stories of how Marinovich would kind of get into the huddle and change the play on purpose and kind of, you know, do it. And, and the players loved all of that and drove Larry Smith crazy. And, you know, you got the sense that Marinovich never really sort of even like peaked at USC, but he still won the Rose Bowl. Uh, coach as a quarterback and then of course you know had some challenges with substances and whatnot and then you know tried to revive became you know had that incredible opening with the Raiders and it just didn't quite you know pan out the way it could have but just what a beautiful left-handed quarterback you know the release the arm the throws the mind the vision um, what could have been with Todd Mernovich he's still here in Southern California there was that incredible ESPN 30 for 30 on him many years ago uh, but just for all of the reasons, I mean, he felt like he was kind of USC football's Dennis Rodman coach, you know. <laughs> and so for for all of that, I've got Todd Vernovich as, as my number two. I'm going to hold off on the comments because I have Todd Vernovich on my list also, which I knew okay. we were going to have this. I knew our top three was going to be the same. I just <laughs> didn't know where. But my number two is a year ago last summer, me and Candace did the top running backs in USC history. And that this is the running back I put at number one. Orthol J. Simpson. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. nobody more controversial than Orthol J. Simpson, Bronco Chase. You know the 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 hotel thing. Like when you think of USC, and then all you think of all the scandals. The very first one that pops in your head, even before Reggie, is OJ Simpson. And what he said. Rumor is OJ Simpson had a shady background. Anyway, he grew up in the rough part of San Francisco. I respect OJ Simpson. RP. I respect OJ Simpson as a running back. I respect OJ Simpson as me growing up in kind of the same situation as OJ, South Central LA kid. OJ grew up in the hood of San Francisco. He made it to Brentwood. In that aspect, and I used to tell my friends all that time, I wanted to be OJ before the chase, right? He was in golfing at the Riviera. I still haven't golfed at the Riviera to this day. OJ was able to walk into the Riviera. Hey, OJ, you golf at the Riviera? He was a well known person everybody loved oj and just that lifestyle that you get to live in brentwood you get to build a home in brentwood and be the man like who doesn't want that right that's like every kid's dream from where he came from but unfortunately he had some run-ins but i'm not jealous of his life after he got out of jail in vegas partying with younger co-eds you know doing things like oj was in the news for being oj and he never stopped being oj and so I, I that's the reason why like you can't you you can't leave out OJ. I'm pretty sure I know where OJ is on your list. Um, but well, coach, yeah. it's the it's the perfect segue because OJ is my number one, right? Yeah. I mean, for for all of the reasons that you laid out, I mean, just you know, the trial of the century, right? I mean, right. it's just it's unbelievable. I still remember, coach, to this day. I mean, my mom watched every second of that trial. I mean, you know, it was on every day, you know, the whole day for like six months, eight months, uh, you yep. know, I can't even recall. I remember being in school the day of the, the verdict. Me too. And, you know, they sort of can't like, you know, I, I remember like back in the day, like 
you set up an assembly, you you know, you rolled out the television. I mean, it was a whole thing. I mean, it was absolutely unbelievable. The dream team, if you recall, with Johnny Cochran and Robert Shapiro and uh, so and then Robert Kardashian, you know, uh, Robert Kardashian. And, and, you know, I mean, that was sort of I mean, in many ways, coach, that was the birth of reality television. Right. I mean, that was the moment that that reality television was born uh, with that low speed chase. And I mean, it was just an incredible I mean, it just surreal. Right. I mean, and you saw the chase. I mean, I saw the chase go back, go down my neighborhood. I mean, you know, it, it, cause it was a it was a chase all over the city. I mean, it was just unreal. And then obviously just the shock. I mean, and, you know, the overwhelming DNA evidence of, uh, you know, what what uh, what transpired. Uh, and then obviously it was it was a story of, of race. It was a story of class. It was a story of living a double life. I mean, it sort of just it, it, it captivated the entire country. I mean, it was absolutely a tragic ending to the two victims. Of course, that's first and foremost. But, you know, this guy went from truly an, an icon. I mean, you know, you, 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 in terms of his USC career, in terms of the, with, the, with the Bills and the NFL career, he was on NBC. I mean, he was the guy doing the games as the sideline reporter, all those Hertz commercials, if you remember. I mean, yep. he was like the most marketable guy. I mean, in many ways, Coach, O.J. Simpson was kind of Peyton Manning before Peyton Manning from an endorsement standpoint, yeah, you no know, with, with, with the yeah. NFL. Um, and you know, you sort of had this golden image. It was almost like an Obama esque image that he had. Really, it was like Obama Denzelian image that he had. And then he went from that to, um, as as many of us sort of perceive to be this uh, this, I mean, incredible murderer. I mean, I mean, how how much more controversial uh, can you get? I mean, the savage murderer. Um, you know, by all indications. Um, and so that juxtaposition, I think, to this day is still wild. And I think it's, you know, a lot of the it, it, I have to say this, coach, just to kind of keep it 100 percent real. You know, I, I really wonder with the university, you know, where that thought process was of taking down Reggie Bush's jersey, but not taking down OJ's jersey. Right. I and I know one was story. related to kind of a direct NCAA you know, perceived violation and the other was non-football related, but you just got to wonder in terms of just a code of conduct in terms of, from a kind of an ethical perspective, a moral perspective, you know, why that didn't happen. So for all those reasons, coach, uh, OJ, number one, most controversial figure in USC football history for me. I got to tell you a really good OJ story, actually. So freshman year, we're at practice in the middle of camp, like, August dog days of camp and that time we had two a days and we actually had three we had practice we had a walkthrough with no ball <laughs> and then we had another practice so then we were then so then we were doing one two ones but we really we were really doing two three twos but neither here nor there it's over they can't get us for it now um OJ walked on one day in the morning practice we had our practices about nine it was about 10 a.m OJ walked on practice Pete really didn't care because, you know, Pete was welcoming in everybody. It was O.J. Simpson. I, I wouldn't care either. And then our DFO walked over to Pete and Pete was like, kind of like, I don't care. He's here. And then I guess word got back to Heritage Hall. And then the DFO walked over to Pete again. And Pete was like, kind of look like, well, you deal with it. <laughs> so then security came, told O.J. he had to leave. Wow. And OJ got loud and upset and pretty much said, I'm, I'm OJ F and Sifton. I built this place. Do you not know who I am? How can you kick me off of this? And people try to like tell him like it wasn't me. He was not happy about getting kicked off the of campus. Wow. So <laughs> that's definitely a big time OJ story. But have you ever also have you ever heard the saying the reason why OJ OJ got off for two reasons? And do you know what those two reasons are? I heard, you tell me. SC. I heard this at SC. It's because okay. he had okay. money. He had money and he went to USC. They said if he would have went to UCLA, he would have been in jail. <laughs> That's the, <laughs> you know, I, I I don't know about that one, Coach. Uh, to be honest with you, I think there were some some other elements at play. Uh, you know, the least of which had to do with where he went to school. You know, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, you know, that's. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's sort of crazy that even in in that type of a circumstance. Um, 
you know, there, there's there's a reference to the crosstown rivalry, right? Yeah, you know? yeah, I mean, it's definitely. like that's that's sort of uh, that's crazy, right? You know, um, but but welcome to LA with these <laughs> two schools, uh, you know, ten miles apart. It's so crazy. I know it doesn't. When we talk about us all the time, it's so crazy how underrated nationally the rivalry really is. You know what I mean? But we'll say that for the Victory Bell show later on in the year. Um, my number one is your number two, Todd Marinovich. And the reason why I say that is because I and I know like we could split hairs between OJ and Todd Marinovich, but Todd Marinovich was the golden child. But what if I told you there's a lot of players like that, and there's a lot of players who end up the exact same way. There's like five of them off my SC team, exact same way, ended up the exact same way as Todd Marinovich. He never had a Big Mac or Oreo cookie until he went to college, right? And I mean, we both went to SC. And we both went down the road and we both walked into some of them houses and we both see some crazy stuff. And if you've never seen it before until you're a freshman in college with no rules, you know, peer pressure is really, really, really strong to overcome if you never had to overcome it. And I mean, I don't know your background to an extent, but like, I'm pretty sure you've been in situations where you're like, nah, man, I'm good on that. Come on. No, I'm good. Like you've been in a situation multiple times and I've been in a situation multiple times before I got to college. He's never been in that situation right, until he right. gets to college. And it's like, here, eat this Big Mac. Here, try this. Here, try this. It's like, all right, cool. Like, I don't have to listen to anybody. Oh, man, I'm blowing up. And then you get college is still. And when I used to recruit, I used to tell parents this. this. College is your last chance of developing yourself before you get into the real world and becoming an adult. And as great as college is and as much freedom you have, there's no freedom like being an adult. You know what I mean? Like, but there's so many rules and you're not prepared by the time you get out of college. And he wasn't prepared and he was given NFL money, which was still a lot of money at that time, even though you go look at his contract and people say he only got $500,000. Well, in the early nineties, that was a lot of money. You know what I mean? And you get that money and you get that freedom. And then now you're in an NFL scene partying like in it with NFL people doing NFL stuff that you've never had the opportunity to like know what it does to you or you've been sheltered your whole life. It's like those types of things. It's a sad story. And I, and I've seen it so many times. That's why it's my number one. I've seen it so many times. Like these parents want to put all their might into these kids and live through these kids to get a pro contract. But at the end of the day, it's not the parents' money. It's not the right. parents' happiness. It's the kids' happiness. And right. it, it hurts me. So, like, just the story of Todd Marinovich. And I've heard about the story. You know what? That My parents used that as an example for me as I was coming up being recruited and everything. They were like, I was able to go to parties. I was able to do a lot of things. And, like, my mom always told my dad, like, I don't want our kids to become Todd Marinovich. They have to learn the world now while they're in a learning stage before they get to a point to where they can no longer learn the world and it's way too late. So like, it's heartbreaking. It's sad. Like, I think that's just the most, con- he could have been a yellow jacket guy for but, sure. You know what I mean? Like he was so, I mean, coach, he, he, I mean, if you look at, if you look at Todd Murnovich's skill set, I mean, he was Steve young with a bigger arm. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, it was, he was sort of Steve young, with like a Marino release. I mean, it was kind of insane, you know? I mean, so when you say he's totally a gold jacket guy, absolutely. And it's a, you know, coach, it's so well said that sometimes when, you know, as parents, you know, we, we want to sort of live through our children, you know, because we want them to do the things that we never got to do. And so it comes from kind of a good place, but it sometimes gets wrapped around, um, you know, in these interesting ways and there's kind of an ego and there's a control and there's, you know, it, it loses sort of its purity. And I've seen it so much, Coach, not necessarily with athletes, but just, you know, being from kind of an Indian American family and, you know, there's that pressure, you got to go to med school and, you know, or, or you got to go be an engineer or, you know, and and so parents are kind of putting that pressure um, on, uh, you know, their children to kind of do this. And then the moment they sort of step out and get the freedom, it just it go, it goes nonlinear very very quickly. It's not even like oh I'm gonna push back a little bit. The moment you get that taste of freedom, it it goes nonlinear very very quickly. And so it's a very sad uh, history there for for Todd because he you know what a talented guy 
Um, but, you know, it's sort of almost ironic, Coach, that his number was 12 because, you know, he was number one on my <laughs> list, uh, number one on your list, number two on my list. And so, yeah. you know, uh, fitting that he was number 12. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it really it could have been there. And, and you know, Coach, I, I hate to say this, but and I don't think it's and I don't wish this in any way, shape or form or even I'm predicting it. But I have to be honest. And, and Ryan and I have sort of talked about this offline a little bit as well. There is an element of Caleb in in that regard of sort of like this sort of structure, you know, with, with the dad and, you know, this sort of unbelievable focus where you hope that Caleb has had enough kind of freedom within that structure where now that he's in the NFL, it doesn't get nonlinear, you know, like yeah, I don't yeah. I don't think it was what 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 Todd Marinovich had to go through but but there is there is some ingredients of that with Caleb you know and and I think hopefully it was just the right amount to get him to be the number one pick and have a wildly successful career in the NFL um but you know just cautiously you sometimes wonder I I think it's I think it's a little I think he had some freedom because you gotta Todd Marinovich couldn't go anywhere but USC or UCLA you know what I mean his dad wouldn't lead him let him leave the state like Caleb Went from DC to Oklahoma. Yeah, Oklahoma yeah, to yeah. That's totally fair. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's a little bit. I don't think it's that extreme, but there are. I, I will say this though, Caleb's dad is actually getting a lot of credit, um, because of how he tried to negotiate Caleb Williams' contract. Right. He just got 39 million, and would he get 28 up front? Mm-hmm. So he got all his money up front, and. When you think about it, when you propose it, like just give us a big signing bonus and then you help the team out because the rest of the 38 million won't hit the cap. You're paying me what like two million dollars a year to, to flex the rest of the money out. You could go get whoever you want to make my kid a better quarterback. Like, there's so many things he, he tried to take the tag off and things like that. Like, so sometimes there is a best interest. Like they try yep, to put yep. in no franchise tag. You know, there is a best interest, but there is over the top that you do go through and I do wish the best for Caleb. I, I really want Caleb to succeed. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So Absolutely. No question. That's, that's good. Well, that was our list. We put it together. I would like to – I wonder what people think. Yeah, no. I wonder, I th- I, this one could could get very interesting. We, we talk about nonlinear, Coach. The comments might get nonlinear very quickly. But, uh, you know, it was a, no, a very interesting conversation. Perfect no, for the offseason. Yeah, no. And then and then we. I, I'm curious to see who we missed. Yeah. Right, because yeah. you'd be like, "Oh, yeah, oh, well." I, me personally, I could have named a bunch of people that we don't know about this issues that happen. <laughs> I wasn't gonna, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> there's a list of people you're like, "What? No way!" So yeah, definitely. I will say this, Jamal. I'm, a, I'm gonna bring it up on air real quick. The Mount Rushmore, when we have the Aaron Donald conversation off air, I asked a lot of football people, and they didn't agree with you. About about Aaron Donald being being tied with LT for greatest defensive player of all time. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's. I mean, we we may need to open with that the next episode, Coach. Yeah. You know, we'll cliffhanger that one. But I I asked a lot of my coaching friends, and they they put they even put Reggie White and Bruce Smith above Aaron Donald. Okay. Okay. Uh, and there's reasons why, and it makes sense. And one reason I will give somebody said somebody said name one person off that Giants team. That LT won a Super Bowl with, and I was like, "Oh, damn!" Like LT won a Super Bowl on defense. Two, <laughs> two, yeah. yeah, you know what I mean. So like, well, that, yeah. and who? I was like, "Wait, was this quarterback Phil Sims?" And he was like, "Well, how? I'm not sure." I'm and it was like, even if it was Phil Sims, how good was Phil Sims really as a pro quarterback? Well, it was it was Phil Sims. Uh, you know, he he was the primary quarterback during that period. But remember that the one, the 91 against the Bills, Jeff Hostetler was the quarterback in the Super Bowl. So, you know. Exactly. Exactly. So definitely. Let's cliffhanger that. Let's hang that. Let's let's hold on to that. And we'll get let's put a pin in it, coach, as they say. Let's put a pin in it, you know, or 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 as our governor will say, let's table it for another session. Yeah, let's take it offline, as, as you I, would say in business. Yeah, in you business. Know, let's business, take it offline you know, in a business meeting, coach. Let's take let's, that one offline. Let's take you know? that one off. <laughs> Normally when they say that, that means I'm wrong. I need to get my facts <laughs> together. Let's have this conversation because I don't want to get embarrassed in this <laughs> When I'm prepared. Yeah, yeah exactly. Definitely. <laughs> yep. Or or it's like I'm pissed off. Let me let me recoup because we're gonna this means gonna go left. But definitely Jamal it was a good one. It was a great one. It's so fun. How about we do it again on Monday? Let's I think we have again. I think we should have that Mount Rushmore talk on Monday. I know it's a let's have the Mount Rushmore talk on Monday. Let's do it. 
definitely good deal. I appreciate you, Jamal. I appreciate all the fans. Appreciate everybody for tuning in. It's the Ban on Watch with Detroit podcast. You guys know how it goes. Live free, fight on. The living room is where you make life's most beautiful memories. But your sofa shouldn't be the one remembering them. The new life-resistant, high-performance furniture collection from Ashley is designed to withstand all the spills, slip-ups, and muddy paws that come with the best parts of life. Ashley high-performance sofas and recliners are soft, on-trend, and easy to clean. Shop the high-performance furniture in-store or online at ashley.com. Ashley, for the love of home.